Hello and welcome to the Fall Education Webinar on Fertility and Infertility in Cystic Fibrosis. With that, we invite you to sit back, relax, and enjoy today's presentation. I would now like to introduce your speakers for today. Dr. Elizabeth Pullis, Head of Respiratory, Respirology and Director of the Adult Cystic Fibrosis Program at St. Michael's Hospital in Toronto. Anna Sang, Nurse Practitioner at the Toronto Adult Cystic Fibrosis Center at Michael, St. Michael's Hospital. Nathan Fish, an adult with cystic fibrosis from London, Ontario, and the Chair of Cystic Fibrosis, Canada's Adult Cystic Fibrosis Committee. Michelle DeCourcy, an adult with cystic fibrosis from Edmonton, Alberta. And Dr. Keith Jarvie, Head of Urology and Director of the Murray Copper Urologic Wellness Center at Mount Sinai Hospital in Toronto. Dr. Phyllis, you now have the floor. Welcome to all. Um, thanks a lot. I'm really looking forward to uh, hearing all the speakers today. And I'm going to tackle the first subject, which is cystic fibrosis and female fertility. And um, over the overview or the outline for the program is I'm going to talk a little bit about fertility in women with cystic fibrosis and then talk about pregnancy and CF and some of the um, areas that are important there, the overall statistics, how does pregnancy affect one's health, and what, what concerns we need to have, if any, about CF medication. I'll talk briefly about delivery and breastfeeding, and also mention when, when would be a sort of medical time when pregnancy is not advised. Now, the good news is, is that you know, over the last several decades, there's been improving survival in people with cystic fibrosis, and more uh, better survival means more adults with CF, and more adults with CF means more people wanting to start a family. So this has become an uh, increasing issue over time. One of the questions that people ask initially is, is fertility in women with CF reduced? I think people, a lot of people are aware that in men with CF, there is reduced fertility. But the problem with fertility in women is that it's very difficult to actually assess it. You know, with men, you can sort of do a semen analysis and see if there's sperm in the semen. But to assess fertility in women is a little bit more difficult because it's, you have to try and get pregnant and not be able to get pregnant um, in order to be able to tell if someone's fertile. Now, in the past, the problem was is that um, healthcare providers gave people with CF, women with CF, the advice that they shouldn't try to get, get pregnant or have children, and so that it was very difficult to assess fertility if people weren't, in fact, trying to have, uh, uh, have a pregnancy. If you look back in the literature, the first reported pregnancy in CF was in 1960, and you can see that both from the American um, U.S. Uh, CF patient registry and from the Canadian patient data registry, there's increasing um, uh, numbers of pregnancies. So in 1986, in that year, there were 50 pregnancies in women with CF reported in the States, and by 2009, there were 226 pregnancies reported. As would be expected with the difference in the overall population, about a tenth as many pregnancies as seen in the States would be seen in Canada. And in 2010, 21 pregnancies occurred in women with CF across Canada. Now, why are, you know, what are the factors that might influence fertility in women with CF? Well, one of the factors we've known about for a long time, and that is that the CF protein, CFTR, actually is present in the cervix. And that means that the secretions in the cervix are thicker than normal. Ordinarily, what happens is that during the, a woman's um, menstrual cycle, at the time of ovulation, the secretions become very watery and thin, and that allows uh, the sperm to penetrate through the secretions to fertilize the egg. But in women with CF, this isn't happening. There's no thinning at the time of ovulation, so this thick mucus acts as a barrier to the sperm. There are some other reasons why fertility in women with CF may be reduced. One of them is, again, related to the CF chloride channel. And the defect in CFTR actually alters the bicarbonate concentration in the uterus. And having an abnormal bicarbonate concentration can affect sperm function. So that the sperm, even if it gets into the uterus, may not work as well. And finally, there's some suggestion that there may be reduced ovarian reserve in women with CF. And that means that there may not be, the, the problem may be at the level of the eggs 
and where they have um, uh, some some data to support this is that if you look at the mouse model of CF, you find that my, female mice with CF have uh, reduced ovarian function. We've noticed by uh, screening women in our clinic, and Anna Sang, our nurse practitioner, did this study, that we found that women with CF seem to have earlier menopause, and other researchers have found that women with CF have a delay in when the, the, the age at which their first menstrual cycle starts. And we also know that women with CF have more periods that are not associated with ovulation. So there's some suggestion that the problem is not just a barrier at the cervix, or an abnormal environment in the uterus, but there may be something wrong with the ovary as well. In fact, Cystic Fibrosis Canada funded a study um, at our center looking at ovarian function in CF, and 20 women with CF were compared to 20 control women. And we looked at um, all sorts of measures of fertility of um, the ovaries, and one of them was this AMH, or anti-malarian hormone level, and that is a good marker of ability to conceive. And what we found in this study is that women with CF had lower levels of AMH than the control women, and that suggested that lower ovarian reserve happened in CF, and that might relate to lower fertility. Obviously, more uh, research is needed to be done in this area. Now, when we're in clinic and women come to see us and they want to uh, consider having a family, there's usually sort of a set of questions that, that you know, we get down to talking about because these are the key questions that people want to know. And the first question is, can they get pregnant? And the second question is, will it have a negative impact on their health? People want to know what are the challenges of getting through a pregnancy and raising a child. And people are concerned about the CF medications and will they harm the, the baby. Everyone's always interested in delivery because the labor and delivery is always a scary part of things. Um, and then people want to know would they be able to breastfeed their infant. And then finally they want to know what will change in terms of management of their CF during their pregnancy. So I'm going to go through all of these points and address them. So the first question, can women with CF get pregnant? And the answer is absolutely. And in fact, even women with very low lung function and low nutritional status um, have successfully conceived. But because of the reasons I mentioned a few slides ago about perhaps lower fertility in women with CF, it might take a little bit longer to conceive than would be considered normal. And occasionally, women will need assisted reproductive techniques. So it's important to talk to your CF um, physician and ab about wanting to have a child and how long you've been trying to have a child so that the CF team knows when to intervene with doing further investigations and consultation with a fertility expert. The second question is, will pregnancy negatively impact the mother's health? And this is a question that could be answered looking at large databases like the Canadian Data Registry. And overall, the answer is no, that the overall outcomes of women with CF are excellent. And it's, it's, it's um, given more credibility by the fact that large studies done in both the states and Canada have found similar findings. And that pregnancy itself does not have a negative impact on outcome or prognosis. Now, of course, it's important to remember that extrapolating from large studies, the conclusions from large studies, don't always apply to an individual. So we can say overall what happens to women with CF who they get, when they get pregnant, but we can't predict what will happen for each individual. So if you look at the American experience, where they did a study looking at the uh, CF Foundation patient data registry in the States, and this database has over 28,000 people with CF in it. And they wanted to see what impact pregnancy had on overall survival. So they looked between um, a period of about 12 years, and they found that there were over 8,000 women who were over the age of 12, and therefore in their age range to be able to conceive. And they found over those uh, 12 years, 10% of women became pregnant. When they looked at the women who became pregnant and compared them to the women in the database that were not pregnant, what they found is that women who were pregnant were initially a bit healthier. They were a little bit older in age. 
they had slightly better lung function, and their nutritional status was better. So women who became pregnant actually started out healthier than women who didn't get pregnant. And, of course, this makes sense. If you're healthier, you're more likely to consider um, uh, thinking about starting a family. Now, the results of the study showed that women who got pregnant had a 10-year survival rate of 77%. That means 77% of women who got pregnant were alive 10 years later. The women who did not get pregnant had a lower survival rate, suggesting that overall, women who got pregnant did better than women who didn't. Now, of course, you have to make an adjustment because the women who got pregnant, we, I just said on the previous slide, were healthier. So you have to adjust for the initial severity of illness. And when you do that, they showed that women who got pregnant didn't have shortened survival. So there was no difference in survival between those who got pregnant and those who didn't. They actually looked at subgroups, including women with CF who had low lung function, you know, FEV1 below 40%, or those who had diabetes, and they didn't find any harmful effects of pregnancy in either of these groups. Now, there was another study that was done looking at data from Canadian and American um, patients, and again, looking at a period of time that was um, almost uh, it was eight years long in 24,000 uh, patients. And they found 216 women who got pregnant in this time frame, and they matched them with women who never got pregnant during this time frame. And they looked at what happened at baseline during the pregnancy and over two and a half year follow up period. And what they found was very similar to the previous study, that overall, the women who got pregnant were healthier at baseline than the women who didn't. And there were fewer women who had low lung function, the ones who got pregnant. Again, this sort of, um, uh, you know, predicting that, you know, people who are considering having children generally have better health. Now, interestingly, the women who didn't get pregnant had higher baseline levels for diabetes when they, when they, uh, at the start of the study. But overall, what they found was that during a pregnancy, the number of times that people needed to come into hospital for a chest infection or the number of chest infections both increased during pregnancy and that there were more uh, clinic visits in women who were pregnant. Now, part of this may be that if you're pregnant, you're more um, likely to look after your health. You're perhaps more likely to visit the clinic more often because your team wants to uh, keep a closer eye on you. And you may be more quick to respond to a chest infection because you obviously want your health to be maximized. But it, there, the data certainly showed that more visits to clinic, more chest infections during pregnancy. And the other thing that they found was that gestational diabetes or the development of diabetes during the pregnancy was much higher than it would be seen in the population of people who did not have CF. So 20% of women with CF who got pregnant had diabetes during their pregnancy. So that's an important fact to know about ahead of time that there is a possibility that you may develop diabetes during pregnancy and that may or may not disappear at the um, after delivery. So overall, the studies show that there's more women with CF becoming pregnant. Pregnancy itself does not have a negative impact on survival, but there's more chest infection and hospital admissions and clinic visits when you're pregnant. And gestational diabetes is more common than in women who don't have CF. Now, the next question people ask are, what are the challenges of pregnancy and child rearing? And the funny thing here is that the pregnancy part is usually easier than looking after a small child. And I'm sure any women on the call who have uh, uh, small children will know um, that uh, <laughs> that's probably the case um, in, all, in all circumstances. And that's because it's difficult to care for a child and manage a chronic illness. And so Anna will talk a little bit more about this in her section, but it's really important to discuss the fact that having a chronic illness means a little less time in order to do one's treatment and perhaps needing a little bit more help with child care. So questions and discussions have to happen around our family supports in place, who will help them raise the child if the mother is um, unwell or um, in, the, in the very tragic situation that the mother passes away. 
Now, people are concerned about CF medications and the impact they would have on pregnancy. And generally speaking here, the news is very good. That CF, um, compared to other illnesses where the drugs are quite toxic, generally CF medications have been in use for a long time and are generally safe. So the basic category of medications like bronchodilators, which would be Ventolin um, as an example, are certainly safe, and there's lots of experience in women with asthma who have used these medications in pregnancy. What about antibiotics? Well, there's inhaled antibiotics, there's oral or pill form antibiotics, and there's IV antibiotics. And selected antibiotics are very safe with decades of experience in using them. Some antibiotics are not safe in pregnancy, and this is the kind of thing that your CF um, physician and pharmacist will be very um, aware of. Now, with the inhaled antibiotics, the fact is that the amount of the antibiotic that gets in the bloodstream after you inhale a medication is very low. So generally speaking, that there's extremely low risk to the infant. Inhaled corticosteroids like Pomacort or Flovent are okay. And of course, pancreatic enzymes are safe. Now, Palmazine was not tested in pregnancy as part of the studies, but there have been more and more women getting pregnant and going through pregnancy while on Palmazine. So there's more experience of use, and there's no reports of problems during pregnancy with Palmazine. Hypertonic saline is just, of course, salt water and is safe in pregnancy. And uh, gastrointestinal medications, for example, medications for heartburn, like uh, ranitidine or Zantac or Losec, are also safe. And often what uh, physicians and pharmacists need to do is to look at databases such as Mother Risk that talk about individual medications and studies done of uh, more uncommon medications to see if there's any harm. So overall, there's very little um, adjustment that needs to be made to the standard treatment of CF during pregnancy. What about delivery? Well, there was also a concern um, that was a sort of a theoretical concern that there would be more preterm labor. That means babies born prematurely. But interestingly, these studies, you know, can't, so these questions can't be asked, answered in the large database studies because they don't collect information down to uh, what um, gestational age the baby was born at. But when you look at single center studies where there is more detailed information, it appears that the rate of prematurity is not increased over the general population. It also appears that the baby's weight is, um, uh, is also uh, fine, um, but of course that's uh, difficult to predict for individual patients and depends a lot on the weight gain of the mother. The good news is that labor and delivery is usually not a problem, or I should say not more of a problem than labor and delivery is for, for anyone. Uh, vaginal delivery is the preferred option because then you don't have the issues related to pain from the incision of a cesarean section. And what's key is good um, pain control after delivery, keeping an eye on oxygen saturation, and making sure that the mother is getting her inhaled medications uh, throughout the labor delivery period of time. People are very interested in breastfeeding because of the known benefits to uh, children. And from a CF point of view, breastfeeding is fine. The only kind of um, caveat we say is that because it needs 500 calories a day of energy to breastfeed, the nutritional status of the mother must be okay. So if the woman didn't gain much weight during the pregnancy, and therefore her nutritional status after delivery is low, it's, it's difficult to try and maintain or regain your weight and eat an additional 500 calories a day. So what our dietitians say is that if nutritional status is good and everything's going fine with respect to the, to the, the woman's ability to gain weight during pregnancy and her weight postpartum, then breastfeeding is fine. And the breast milk in women with CF is normal with respect to its sodium and protein and fat concentrations. Now, the management of CF during pregnancy is not a lot different than the management before pregnancy. It's just a little bit more frequent. And the baseline clinic visit is usually one where we discuss the overall health status of the woman. What's her nutritional status? How's her lung? How are her lungs? Is she having a lot of chest infections? 
Has there been a change or decline in lung function? And we're looking to sort of see that we're in a stable condition, which is obviously the best condition for a woman's body to be in if she is going to um, be, um, you know, uh, nourishing a child for nine months. That's the time when we screen for diabetes, make sure people are on their prenatal vitamins, make any adjustments to medications, and do genetic counseling and testing. And Anna will talk more about that in her talk. So the visits are usually, although not necessarily at the beginning, monthly, with close monitoring of weight, screening for diabetes in each trimester of the pregnancy, and keeping an eye on lung function. If a woman does have a chest infection, we want to treat aggressively to make sure that her lung function is maintained. If a woman does have gestational diabetes or has diabetes before the pregnancy, we're closely monitoring because good diabetic control is crucial in order for the baby's out, um, outcome. So we'll monitor with phone calls or email. We're looking for tight blood sugar control, and we're measuring the hemoglobin A1C, a marker of blood sugar control, on a regular basis to make sure that we're, um, that we're happy with the care. During the delivery, sometimes a woman's blood sugar drops, so it's very important to make sure that there's a source of calories coming in through the intravenous um, if the woman's not able to eat during delivery. And if we see there's fall off in weight or the lung function slipping, we make sure the visits are more frequent. Now, I frequently get asked this question, not in fact by women with CF, but by other doctors who are worried about what might happen to their female patients who are considering pregnancy. And I get asked, when is pregnancy not advised? And I think over the years what I've learned is there's no hard and fast rules. And it's very difficult to predict who will have problems during pregnancy and who will sail through it. And the things that are worrisome are if somebody is unstable, frequent chest infections, uh, low lung function or dropping lung function, or very malnourished, these are things that make you feel that the woman's condition, health condition, is not really stable enough to withstand the sort of um, the stress of pregnancy. Obviously, a lack of family support is, is something that is worrisome as well because family is really crucial for a woman going through the pregnancy and then looking after a child. But I think what's important is that if people ha are making an informed decision, they will make the right decision. So what is most important is for the healthcare team to talk about all the things I've mentioned in my talk and to talk about why it's important to be stable and why it's important to have a good lung function and good nutrition. And, and sometimes people are not in the best position to have a child now, but these things can all be worked on and it may be something that they can um, put as a goal in terms of improving their health so to more safely tolerate a pregnancy. Now, in 2007, we, seven, we had the 100th baby born to uh, women with CF in our clinic, and we're still counting. We probably have between three and six women a year who are um, getting pregnant. Here are some of the lovely um, end results of that. And uh, it's really a very positive and optimistic time um, to be able to see people fulfilling their goals of having a family. Now, in our clinic, we're actually seeing women who are grandmothers. And of course, they tell us that's even better because you have all the pleasures of um, having a small child you love and none of the hassles of being up at night with babies crying. So at this point in time, I'm going to stop and I'm going to pass over to Dr. Jarvie. So he's going to be uh, talking about uh, the male fertility aspect. Thank you very much. Um... I'm going to go back to the first slide. One second here. I'm just backing up to my slide collection. Thanks, Liz. Um, okay, great. I'm a meteorologist, and I'm talking today about some of the um, issues that men with cystic fibrosis have dealing with fertility issues. And I'm just going to give a little bit of the background about the anatomy of the men who have cystic fibrosis. 
and then some of the potential uh, fertility options that we have to treat the men who have cystic fibrosis. Um, again, this, a lot of the same issues arise about the uh, social issues that uh, I think Anna, Anna will talk about later, um, and having children with cystic fibrosis, and Liz has always spoken to that uh, at length. Um, yeah. So I'm just going to begin with a, a general overview of the male reproductive tract, um, and um, really very basically, sperm are being produced within the testicle, and then the sperm transit through the tubes called the epididymis through the vas deferens and out through the prostate. Out through the prostate, so that it comes out in the semen. Um, sperm are being produced in the testicle on a on an ongoing basis, and uh, there's literally millions of sperm being produced uh, per day. So, in order to have normal fertility, the, um, f the sperm has to be produced in adequate numbers. There has to be a normal uh, system to conduct the sperm out from the testicle in place. And you also have to have all of the surrounding structures like the prostate and the seminal vesicles which contribute fluid to the, uh, the semen which allow men to have children. So, in men with cystic fibrosis, what the finding is in general is that they have low semen volume and they mostly have no sperm and ejaculation. So what we know now is that men with cystic fibrosis in general produce sperm and it's a plumbing issue. The tubing called the vas deferens is quite often missing in men with cystic fibrosis and the seminal vesicles are quite often missing. Interestingly, despite this, men with cystic fibrosis generally have perfectly normal sexual function, have normal sexual drive and normal sexual function. They produce normal amounts of sperm, and in general, the sperm are considered to be quite fertile. Basically, this is a plumbing issue where the tube, tubes are missing. Um, if you look at things like testicular size, men with cystic fibrosis have perfectly normal testicular size unless they have other uh, health issues that are associated with cystic fibrosis, and then the testicles do decline in size. They also have normal hormones of reproduction, like FSH, follicle-stimulating hormone, testosterone. And in general, the production of sperm is also normal. <clears throat> Again, this is just an illustration of what we find in typically in men with cystic fibrosis. And again, the pictures on the uh, right side of the screen are open pictures of uh, the testicle. And I hope you can appreciate that the tubing called the epididymis is missing on the top picture. Um, and so this is a patient with cystic fibrosis who has pretty normal testicular size. A little bit of uh, epididymis is present, but then a very great segment of the epididymis, and it turns out the vas deferens was also missing in this in this man. So the question is, if they're producing sperm and it's not getting out, are those sperm perfectly normal? In other words, are the sperm in the testicle normal functioning sperm? And the answer is yes and no. The sperm counts within the testicle normal. The ability of the sperm to move is considered to be normal. The sperm also look normal, but there's some reduction in the ability of those sperm to bind to an egg and to fertilize an egg. But if the sperm are injected inside an egg, they have the normal fertilizing capacity for men with cystic fibrosis. So what can we do now? And really this is conceptually very simple. We can retrieve sperm from around the testicle or the testicle itself. It's called sperm aspiration. And inject those sperm into eggs. And what happens is um, the sperm are retrieved. And this can be either with an open technique. And there's different names that you'll hear this called. One is called a MESA, M-E-S-A. It's a microepididymal sperm aspiration. 
And what that means is with a microscope, we look down and retrieve sperm from the epididymis directly. And the other open technique is to take a piece of the testicular tissue, then the laboratory um, takes the testicular tissue and they are able to retrieve the sperm from the tissue. Those are the two open techniques. You'll also hear words like PISA, which is a percutaneous technique, and we can put a needle through the skin directly into either the epididymis, which is called a PISA, or into the testicle, which is called a TESI, a percutaneous testicular biopsy, and that way we could obtain sperm from the testicle or the epididymis. Following that, or actually it's done at the same time, so it's not really following this, typically the women are prepared for the in vitro fertilization cycle. Unfortunately, the only way to use the sperm from the testicle or the epididymis is with in vitro fertilization. And this is a two-step process for the women. The women are typically given fertility medications, and what these medications do is bring a number of eggs, a mature number of eggs at the same time, and quite often there will be five to ten eggs matured with the fertility medications. Following this, uh, an ultrasound is usually used through the vagina to retrieve the eggs from the, uh, from the ovaries. And then what happens is the sperm which have been retrieved from the man are injected into the eggs which have been retrieved from the women in a process called ICSI, I-C-S-I, which is another term that you'll hear fairly frequently. Um, and when they, when they inject the sperm into the eggs, the sperm begin to fertilize the eggs. And eventually these, these egg and sperm combinations form embryos. At about two to five days after the injection of the sperm into the eggs, the embryos form and are eventually transferred back into the women. And that's how ICSI or ICSI is performed. The procedures are very successful now. They're being done very frequently. And in most men with cystic fibrosis, we are able to retrieve sperm. For most couples, they're able to have fertilizations and produce embryos. And you can expect pregnancy rates of somewhere around 40% chance of having a pregnancy. And the chances of having a child at the end of this is somewhere between 30 and 40 percent per trial. This has been done for a lot of men with obstruction, but it has also been done for a lot of men with cystic fibrosis. Um, and there are cases reported, um, and overall the pregnancy rates from men with cystic fibrosis where the sperm is retrieved for in vitro fertilization is somewhere around that 60% range at most, and most centers are reporting around a 40% range. So overall, around 40% of the cystic fibrosis men are able to have a child each time they try in vitro fertilization. The cost, however, is huge, and this is a major impediment to uh, couples taking this technique on. The IVF procedure itself maybe somewhere totaling cost of eleven, twelve, thirteen or fourteen thousand dollars or maybe even more depending upon which centers the uh the couples go to. Um in Canada it's spotty coverage. Each province is different. Quebec right now in Quebec there's full coverage for in vitro fertilization. But in Ontario and the rest of Canada, um most of the couples either rely on some insurance to help out or they have to pay the entire cost themselves. So it ends up being a really dramatic impediment to the couples trying to take advantage of the in vitro fertilization. Um, so I'm going to pass this over now to Anna. I guess you're the next on the list. Okay. Let me get my slides. I guess I have to clean up a little bit from the previous two. Oops. 
Oh, here I am. Okay, so you have heard all these wonderful facts from two very smart doctors. Now you can um, kind of maybe help me together. We can focus on um, the process rather. I would be talking about family planning, and that's applied to many different situations, and also maybe discuss briefly the importance of um, testing your partner for CF carrier status, and because there's a lot of people um, overestimate the risk of their offspring. So by discussing that, perhaps you can get a better idea and can more accurately estimate the risk if you decide to have children in the future. And then I'm going to briefly talk about when I um, meet with a couple or uh, the women, it's very important to discuss, you know, how to find help and resources to make sure that when you're healthy, you have help. When you're ill, you have help. Should the unfortunate event happen, your children and your loved partner will also have help and continue on with life. And also um, how I would like to link patients to other couples who have gone through it because we know the facts, but nothing like someone who had gone through it, especially couples that are going through um, um, art, um, assist reproductive technology. Um, the woman partner has to uh, get very much involved with the whole process. And perhaps at the end, uh, we will talk about when is the real good time to get pregnant and how we um, finalize the referral from our clinic at least. So for me, family planning is really simple. Um, is, is my definition of family planning is really a sensible approach to have a family. And it can apply to, as I mentioned before, very different situations. Um, the one first scenario would be that, yeah, I might like to have a child in the future, but I don't think at the current time I'm not physically or emotionally ready or I am working on my career and my school schooling and I'm not quite ready for it then the most responsible way to approach family planning to make sure that there won't be any un unplanned or unwanted pregnancy. To do that, it would mean using birth control. And in our program, most of the young women uh, have used birth uh, control pill very successfully and it's proven to be most common and most effective and it doesn't really interact very much with the CF medication, including a lot of the antibiotic we use to treat chest infection. A few young ladies chose to use Depo-Pleva, which is a, an injection with um, progesterone, which will prevent uh, ovulation and thinning out the lining of the uterus and making it very difficult for a fertilized egg to implant. And it's only required you to get this injection every 12 weeks, so a lot of people prefer that. The only drawback in this particular option is that, um, as some of you might know, that CF patients tend to ha seem to have a higher risk of um, developing bone thinning or oste osteoporosis osteoporosis, and this particular medication can potentially uh, cause that happen as well. This is not the evening to talk about various um, ways to uh, use birth control, but I have an excellent area that we have put in wonderful information of very different uh, methods from abstaining to di diagram to condom to you name it. Uh, uh, so you can go to our website, and there's a very rich um, uh, section of information that you can read about, and our website is now on the screen, so you can write it down. For another thing most important, while you're not having children yet, but you're still um, enjoying being sexually active, the most important thing is to practice safe sex. And obviously, ladies should expect the respect of asking the gentleman to use a condom. Uh, at least you can help prevent um, the unexpected sexually transmitted disease, and you don't want any additional organism that might affect the health of your reproductive organ when you're ready to, to have a child in the future. For most male with CF, the young man, there are enough studies from Australia, from the UK, and even from Sweden have mentioned that um, many young men actually prefer to have semen analysis done uh, at an earlier age. And one study from Australia especially demonstrated that men learning about their infertility at a later age has much stronger emotional impact 
to the information. So therefore, I believe that it would be probably good to, um, from the pediatric center, almost when patients transition to us, that we can offer this particular service, because that's also at the same time um, you can uh, clarify some issue. Earlier, you you heard from Dr. Javi that these um, young men have normal sexual desire and performance, and you don't want young men to confuse infertility as impotence. That would be kind of a sad thing. So um, so now the next stage would be now you, you think you're going to have a baby in the near future. So if you're a woman living with CAP, you might want to first find out more information about how to have a successful planned pregnancy with successful outcome and best outcome possible. And one of the very beginning step would be to uh, introduce your partner to the clinic and ask him to do a CF carrier testing. And again, this will help you understand a little bit more the risk of your offspring, should your partner is a carrier or not. And we'll t talk a little bit more in detail in the next couple of slides. And then maybe also um, talk about choosing a most appropriate time to start a family, meaning when you're emotionally, physically, and financially available and ready for it, that would be the best. And listen to the doctors or nurse practitioner who works with the clinic um, and knows about this topic very well and find out options such as how to plan a successful pregnancy. And although that's actually the most common method among our young ladies. And for those who don't want to carry it on your own, there will be other options of adoption or surrogacy. Surrogacy is, um, of course, having someone to help carry your own biological child. We have a couple of young women successfully with it, and the babies are absolutely beautiful. So that is also an option. And uh, it may not be a bad option for young women who's at post-lung transplant stage. It may not, uh, you know, affect their health as well. So now that you, for if you're a young man who found a wonderful partner, then you want to think about having a baby in the near future. What would you do? Well, I've talked to many young men, and some of the most difficulty actually is at the beginning. When do I inform my partner that I have CF, that I might have infertility? And I may not have the ability to father a child naturally, but I can father a child with some assistance or some good planning or have a child in a different, with a different option. And it is no right way and when to tell. Um, many tell different stories at different periods of time. The only advice is that you don't want to leave it for too long, and then, then most young ladies would find that um, a bit of a mistrust, but um, we have many different stories. So when I see each of you, maybe that we can talk about more, and I re I can re you know refer you to another young man that who have gone through it and able to share with you. Um, then again, once you found a serious partner, you think that will be your mate to have a, a wonderful baby. Then you should ask this young lady to do a carrier testing at the same way like the young woman. Then you want to find out the actual estimated risk for having a child that may become a child who is also living with CF. And these information sessions are equally you can have with your doctors or your nurse practitioner. I would advise that oftentimes it's better to book a separate time because during a clinic visit, we're also busy getting everyone through. We might not have time to uh, talk all the detail and show you slides and, and all that and, and do more detailed discussion. And for our young men, um, in the last, I would say, 15 years, they're more interested in reproductive technology and uh, having their own biological child. But some would choose the option. In fact, I remember earlier, before 1990, um, end of 1990s, and many young men have, have wonderful family by using the artificial insemination with donor sperm method. And they have lovely family with a couple of children as well. And so adoption is also a, another option. So these are um, stuff that we will talk about during our meetings. CF carrier testing is important in a way because um, you then also explore your feeling about if you should have this high, you, you tend to uh, land on being a higher risk if your partner should be a, a carrier. Because I think it's important to explore those feelings before you venture into having your own children. And um, as you know, that one in 25 Caucasian will carry a CFTR mutation. 
So um, it is not that uncommon that you may run into a CF partner that who also is a carrier of CF mutation. But rest be sure that when we test carrier testing, we're really only testing against 39 most common mutations. But with that testing, it would be enough to estimate uh, the risk because the other mutations are being found every day. I remember when I first started my job, there was only 400 mutations known to me at that time, but now we're looking at 1,700 and more mutations. So even if we test it all, by next year, you might miss one or two. So it's not worth going through the entire panel that people would have very rare mutations that you may not even have. So once you test against that 39, most importantly to realize that it would put you in a very educated low or definite risk, but it is not 100% um, proof that you, you're, oh, you are not carrier. But I think that's probably good enough. 2% risk for infant who um, not having parent did not do carrier testing. But once you did the carrier testing, if your partner happened to be a non-carrier, the risk is now dropped to one in 500. So that's probably a lot of time actually comforting enough for a lot of young couple to uh, you know, start planning. But if the carrier happened to be a, um, if the partner happened to be a carrier, you're looking at a 50-50% chance. So I draw these two diagrams just to show you. At the start, you have to remember that you need one abnormal mutation from each parent. So you have to have two abnormal CF mutation in, you have to have two CF mutation, I mean, to, to have CF. So in a, in a scenario on the left, as you can see that if the square represents the male, does not carry any CF mutation, so he have normal mutation, normal CF1 gene, normal CF2 gene, then he married a young woman or have decided to form a family with a young woman who has CF, which is represented by the dark yellow or orange color with the label of mutation A and mutation B. As you can see that you have to get one of each from each parent, if the father has nothing abnormal to give, it's almost impossible to have two mutations pair up to create um, someone with CF. So as you can see, all the children from this couple, for every pregnancy, chances are they would only be carriers. For instance, one normal A gene will couple with a uh, normal, I mean, sorry, normal one gene will couple with the abnormal A gene for mom or one gene will couple with the abnormal B gene and so on and so on. So it's not possible to have a child with CF. If you look at the right side of this picture, you can see that um, if the young man happened to be someone who's living with cystic fibrosis and have a partner who is also a carrier, meaning one normal gene and one CF mutation, now you can see that mother can also offer one abnormal gene, and there's a good chance that the C gene can couple with A together. Mutation A and C will give a chance of um, cystic fibrosis, and or mutation B and C will also combine and have with creating a child who has cystic fibrosis. And so the chances is really 50-50 if you uh, your partner. Uh, is, a, is a carrier and you are living with cystic fibrosis. So I think a lot of it most important before we talk about another slide is to, just to explore your feeling about it. The options um, can change if you happen to have a uh, chance of uh, having a child 50-50 to have CF. But that's okay with that. It just, you have the information to plan if you have a CF child, you might have to think about changing your tactic and maybe work less because you would your child would have more more doctor's appointments or you have to spend more child more time caring for that child. Now, when is the best time for a woman to become pregnant? Well, it's actually the best time is both you and your partner are ready for it. And then we will have to look at into the your health situation. Is your lung function being maximized at this time? Is there room to further improve your lung function? Although 
you know, there's no hot and you know hot and uh, hot rules about what number. In the earlier study, they talk about 50 percent, but really more important is is you have a decent lung function that has been maximized and take advantage of all the available treatment that that's uh, you know uh, advanced treatment that is available to you to keep that lung function in a good position and remain stable for six months. I tell you, it's much easier to to um, guide a pregnancy through if that young woman has stable lung function before they venture into the pregnancy. And then you think about the nutritional status. Um, I once heard an OB doctor said that babies are parasites. They will survive. Don't worry. But they'll suck nutrients out of the mother the best way they know how to survive. So don't worry about the baby, but worry about the mother. So then you have to think about if your nutrition status is not decent with the body mass index of at least greater than 20, you might have a lot harder time to gain weight through that pregnancy. Also, during the first trimester, you might be a little bit nausea and you might end up losing a little bit more weight at the beginning, then will make it very difficult to catch on later on. Another aspect is that we, we know that now when people are living longer, there's a greater chance of develop CF-related diabetes as an adult and the, the percentage is as high as 40 to 50 percent. And so you want to make sure that you've done a oral glucose challenge test uh, within the last six months. If not, ask the program uh, to the team member to help you uh, facilitate a test like that to make sure that we we can follow um, you closely if you do have uh, oral glucose um, intolerance or have actually have diabetes. For those people that are actually have CF-related diabetes, it is very important to make sure that your blood sugar is in good control at, with the hemoglobin A1C, which reflect how well you manage your sugar over the last three months period to be at least less than 7%. Because study had shown that if you going into a, um, trying to uh, uh, conceive with a much higher than 7% hemoglobin A1C, you exposing your child to uh, neural tubal defect. Those are the cells that make the brain and the spinal cord later on. So you don't want your child to have impaired brain or spinal cord. That's a serious issue. So that's very important. Also, um, the latest guideline from the CDA guideline, uh, 2008, clearly stated that if you do not have CF, then and sexually active, you should stay on folic acid one milligram daily. Uh, if you have CF-related diabetes, then you should probably consider taking five or have diabetes alone. Have, have to start taking five milligram uh, of folic acid at least three months prior to your conception and stay on the same dose until you're at 12 weeks of gestation. Then you can go back to one milligram. And those are little things, but they're very important to assure the child's uh, well development. Well, then how do you identify some resource before your pregnancy to so make sure that the whole pregnancy is going to go through smoothly? Well, first of all, it depends on where you live. You want to identify an obstetrician that is easy access to you. You can go visit him or her frequently if you need to or during your regular visit um, schedule. And um, But most importantly, the obstetrician must be willing to work with us, the CF team, because we will be expecting to follow you, as you remember, um, Dr. Tollers mentioned before, that you know we follow you closely for your sugars, for your vitamin level, for your weight, for your lung function. We want to pay attention to your lung health. So if there is any sign of infection, we will be very aggressive. So that means frequent visit to the CF um, center and it's actually monthly close, you know, um, uh, prefer. So um, obstetrician, we're very lucky at St. Mike. We have a very good group of obstetrician. And they would even go to the ward and visit our patient if you're not feeling well and follow you while you're being hospitalized for CF exacerbation. So, of course, if you live in Toronto, that's easy. But if you live far away from St. Michael's, you might want to find an obstetrician closer to you as long as we can communicate and that then that would be fine. Now, pregnancy does not affect survival, but you talk to any woman who have children, motherhood can sometimes really affect survival. And I think about, you know, my myself having children, I used to love hot food. And when once I have children, while they were little, 
I couldn't enjoy any hot food because you're busy feeding your children first before you eat your own meal. So it is important to remember that even, you know, when you're, you're, you're raising your child, motherhood can be against your health. So you must find the adequate support system, and for good planning, you can actually do that prior to you actually become pregnant or while you're being pregnant. And and that those support systems are very important to check out, like maybe parents on both sides or just one side, um, or other supports like cousins, sisters, or friends. Uh, long ago, I had one woman who told me that you prepare me for everything, but you didn't prepare me for my mother-in-law. Well, it's hard to say. I'm not saying bad things about mother-in-law. I only have sons, so I'll be a mother-in-law someday. But anyway, you want to f- identify people that are actually helpful and that really is not going to cause more stress to you. And you two as a couple must hang in together and find that person and clearly identify when this person can come so you can do your physio, you can take your, you know, take your mask and uh, when they can give you sort of a quick break in the end of the week so you can go to exercise or whatever. You do have to find out these supports and, and should you become ill, who's going to step in and help you out. And if you want more detail, oftentimes it's easy. We have a large program, or even if you're not from our program, to to find to another woman that you can talk to by phone or via email so that they can share their wisdom with you. Now, regarding male, you know, now you have, you're now successful, you have a wife, you want to have children, that's fine, or a good partner, you want to have children. And then this is time to too to find out and explore all the options that I mentioned before. Assist reproductive technique, as, um, artificial insemination with donor sperm, or adoption. Like I said, mentioned before, 15 years now into the, the development of this particular wonderful technique, more and more young men will prefer to have um, to have um, assist reproductive technology to have biological children. You have remember Dr. Jarvie mentioned the course can can be high, and I have a quote between 12,000 to 18,000 that depends on which fertility clinic you go to. So these are realities. So if you want to plan ahead, you might want to save up some more money before you start doing this, and that's very important. Another most important thing to remember, though, is that the major determinant of success really also rests on the age of your partner. Women older than 35 would have reduced um, fertility ability. So um, there have been one study I read that if a woman is older than 40, um, the success rate can be down to 10%. So if you're going to invest this much money, you might not want to uh, wait too long. That's my point. Again, um, I really would wish people that when they start coming to to have a meeting and have the semen analysis. But I can be honestly to tell you that majority of the people that's the first time they are ever over this test. And I hope that these things will change in the future. And But anyway, so that had to be done first to confirm your fertility status or infertility status. And again, like the female living with CF, you need to test your partner to make sure carrier testing is done. Um, I remember that it does influence people's um, uh, decisions. I counsel a couple and I remember when we were talking about carrier testing, the young lady who's married to a young man with CF was saying that if I turn out to be a carrier, I would rather adopt. And um, then then she further explained that I was adopted. I couldn't find better parents. So she, in her case, adoption was just a natural thing to do if, if it's one of the options that she can she can do, she would be happy to do it, and she live it, and she know that it can be successful. And oftentimes, I will connect it to a couple, to another couple, and because um, I had the privilege of knowing all of you very well, or patients very well in my program, and that I know who wants more information than who doesn't need a whole lot of information, just help me, guide me through it, and, and that's it. Some people would want to talk to more people about it. Now, I think it's very important, especially in this particular case, when the male has CF, the female is a partner who is sharing this whole venture. And that, you know, you've talked about earlier, remember Dr. Jari mentioned about fertility drugs to stimulate, you know, you develop more eggs so that they can retrieve it to to um, to let the sperm collect it to fertilize the egg. Well, 
that is going to be some temporary discomfort and emotional upheaval because the fertility drug can affect your moods and, and your feelings and a little bit of a bloating. It's all going to be temporary. But if you talk to someone about it, then you know that it's not going to last forever. It's easier to tolerate, and they can sort of encourage you and tell you the reality of things. And we can also prepare the young men to bow to her during that period and that they can get through that period much easier. So you look into the future, uh, men and, and women with CF, to, then you have to discuss the really the possibility of um, supporting you and caring for a young child should you become ill and and have um, unfortunate early death. I think this is applied to all parents. It doesn't just apply to people living with CF. Personally, I feel that any person who's going to be a parent should consider who can look after your child if you should suddenly get hit by a bus and become seriously ill, or you know who can support you, or if your partner is able to carry on and be a single parent for 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 a long time or for a while until she finds another supportive partner. So those are the very serious issues that I think it should be openly discussed as a dialogue. And then again, search into your support system and who in your relative system within or friends that would be of great support to you should these things happen. And they can be great support to keep you healthy, to allow you time to do your treatment. And also when you're unwell, they can be support to you, to the child and to your loved one. And again, everything costs money. So considering having a child is not cheap. So you need to think about what other adjustment you might have to make. Maybe a smaller house so you can work less hour to spend time with the child and and buy stuff for the child. Or maybe that's some other decision you have to make to, to adjust to a new life of living. And the couple... Um, inform the CF team about referral. Oftentimes, what do we do? So usually after I finish talking to the couple, I would tell them to go home and talk about it. When you decided to be referred, then let me know and we will see you know, who we can refer you to. Now, in my position, it's really easy because I'm in Toronto and I know a lot of good people in Toronto and there's certain uh, fertility for men that I sent to all the time and I'm pretty sure everybody knows who. Um, but there's also other clinic that... Um, and that is very helpful to um, to do the part where they, the gynecologists and, and the fertility specialists to work with the couple eventually. But most of the time, people have done their research and they have kind of an idea who they want to go to, although um, we just sort of give them the facts about uh, who we know. And I base a lot on patient feedbacks. I ask them once they've gone through it, what's good about it, what's not so good about it, what do you like about it? And, um, and one person said, you know, this doctor charged me a little bit more to investigate my wife's issue, um, more detail and 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 that's but I'm so glad because he found this and that and then now we we have this very healthy little baby girl. So that's worth it. So I hear these information but I also respect the the uh, individual an individual couple who already select a referral um, doctor in their in their mind so the final referral basically is based on the patient feedback and the couple's preference so my final words um, I think there's no everyone can find reasons not to have children or have children it's important that the decision must be made by the couple. There's no rules about right or wrong. It is how you feel, how how you would love or not love to have a family under certain certain circumstances. But being a person who's now seasoned and have two grown boys and, and a loving husband for 31 years, I can tell you that really, and um, from learn from my parents as well, I think the best gift any parents can offer to their children really is to love one another. Because I do believe that a child survives through many changes in storm if it was brought up in an environment that's full of love. So now I would like to turn it over to the next speaker, I believe is Nathan. Hi there, uh, actually it's Michelle and uh, 
I'm from Edmonton, Alberta. Actually, I just live outside of Edmonton um, in a town called Churd Park. And, oh, it's a little blurry. It's not quite what it's supposed to be. Um, but I met my husband when I was 19, and we've been married for 18 years. And I am a wife, I'm a mother, I'm a sister, my daughter, and... Um, I have two grown boys, well, not quite grown boys, they're 16, and uh, I am, I have cystic fibrosis, I was diagnosed when I was three, and I've been through many challenges through my life, and that was me, I uh, went through fertility treatments um, to have my boys, my husband and I, like I said, we met when I was 19, got married a year later. We went through many of the processes that the doctors discussed in the previous slides of um, fertility treatments and the discussion of having your partner tested and um, making the decisions on whether to have children or not to have children. Um, we chose to have children. We tested my husband, and he didn't have any of the genes that they tested for back then. So we went through and discussed with my OBGYN about having children, and at the time, I was healthy enough to have children. My health was good. All my stats were good. So we went through fertility treatments of um, daily shots, and injections and I went through an in vitro fertilization at the end of six weeks and it worked. I was pregnant with twins. Um, they were born a little premature. I was in hospital at shortly after this picture that you're seeing here um, and, and I had them, oh no, a week later. Um, you're seeing a picture of one of the boys. Um, that's Tyler that you can see. And you, the other picture is my other son. He was slightly, a um, little bit healthier. They were born three months premature at the Royal Alexander Hospital in Edmonton. Um, the picture that's displaying here um, is Tyler, and he was two pounds, one ounce, and the other son is Dylan, and he was two pounds, five ounces. Um, they spent about, Tyler spent five months in the hospital with three, five surgeries, and Dylan spent three months in the hospital and came home. Um, reason why they were born premature is um, partially to do with my CF. I, I ended up with pneumonia while I was in the hospital um, and they had to treat the pneumonia and the, the drugs for the pneumonia they couldn't give to the babies so it was mom or babies. So they treated mom and we are a family of fighters. So we're all there as a family, making it through. Having to take care of myself was quite difficult, still having to continue to do all my treatments, my pills, taking care of two babies um, was quite difficult because you're still having to maintain your, yourself and take care of everybody while you're maintaining a level of your own care. Watching them grow up hasn't stopped me from carrying on, living life, being myself, staying within the community. Um, part of, I believe, the deterioration in my health um, ended up being where I ended up needing a transplant later on after 
five like five years ago um i had my transplant um believe that it's kind of changed my world um Sorry, this is bringing back a lot of long memories. Um, uh, yeah, this has kind of been, my boys are very special to me. Um, it was a rocky road from the beginning to get them. I have them, love them a lot, and... Uh, I'll pass this on over to Nathan. Uh, if you have any questions after, I, I'll try to answer them, and uh, I'll pass this on over to Nathan. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, so I'm Nathan Fish. Uh, I live in London, Ontario. Um, I'm 36 years old. Uh, some of you uh, I see on the who are on the call uh, probably know me, but um, for those who don't, I was diagnosed as an adult uh, about nine years ago. Um, the diagnosis was not from infertility, which is a common way that some men are diagnosed as an adult. Uh, mine was uh, an exacerbation that um, ended up in hospital, coughing blood, and. Long story short, I was uh, sent over to St. Mike's uh, to see Dr. Tullis and Anna, and um, so that's where they made the diagnosis. Um, and then that led into, um, you know, learning that I, I probably was infertile. Um, uh, at the time I was diagnosed, I hadn't met my wife, um, so I kind of went through some of the things that Anna was talking about, you know, when you meet your partner and, you know, you need to explain to them that you have CF and, you know, uh, <clears throat> some of the implications of that. Um, but we were married in 2006 and we attempted IVF. Um, and Dr. Jarvie was uh, the uro urologist we were um, uh, sent to um, and he performed the procedure on me. Um, and it was, I would say, probably the, the least invasive uh, of the procedures that the guys can go through. Uh, it was the PISA. Um, I understand they usually try that first, and if they don't find anything there, then they have to get a little bit more invasive. So I was fortunate that he was able to um, retrieve sperm through that. Um, for my wife, um, fortunately, and just in terms of the cost, the, the drugs were covered through her benefit plan, but uh, the fees were not, um, and the fees for the, uh, for the PISA were not as well. Um, so for her, um, it was the, probably the egg retrieval was the worst, but also the injections were, uh, very difficult for her as well because, you know, there's very few areas of the body where they can make the injections and it does get quite painful after a while. Um, but we were able to retrieve 10 eggs. Um, six of them were, uh, fertilized and as, you know, usually most clinics, they just implant two at a time in case, you know, if they implant more than that and they all take them can run into some problems there. Um, now, for us, we weren't successful, um, and we made the you know difficult choice not to pursue another round. Um, it was a very emotional experience to you know to go through, um, and it was something we just decided we weren't up to doing again. But uh, there is life without children afterwards, and you know, I must say we're uh, we're quite happy with the, the decision we made. Um, and now we have uh, Mr. Schnauzer, um, who's pretty much our child. Um, and uh, I don't know, to me, I, you know, having a dog, she's 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 almost as much work. It seems like sometimes, but uh, you know, we obviously they're not quite the same. Uh, but we also enjoy, you know, seeing our uh, our siblings with their uh, their children and our niece. So um, that's about all I had. Um, so. Um, I believe we're going to move into the the Q and A portion now, and I think I think now we're moving back to Dr. Tulse to to handle the questions. Yes, that's yes, that's right, Nathan. Thank you. Um, and so, what will happen here is we'll take questions. As you see on the screen, you can type your questions in the question box, which is at the right hand side of the screen. 
and um, I'll kind of review them and pass them out to um, whoever might be able to uh, address some of the questions. Maybe while we're waiting, um, I'll just maybe ask a question. Keith, are you still um, are you still there? I'm going to ask a question um, uh, from Keith Jarvie, just about what he feels sort of the um, if there's any uh, new uh, treatments and, and where things might be going from the male side of things and, and also the female side of things in terms of the um, outcomes. Are we sort of at our best possible outcomes or uh, uh, with the um, sperm aspiration in vitro fertilization and IVF or are there some um, advances that might be coming up? Can you pass it? Can you hear me now? Yep. Yep. Okay. Sorry. So the IVF procedures, which again is the the ones that are used are the injection of the sperm directly into the eggs, that has been available for approximately 20 years now, and there was significant improvements over the course of roughly the first seven to ten years. But... Um, what's happened recently is there's just been very slight increases every year. And the interesting thing is that almost every center across North America has come up to a quite a good level of uh, fertility um, that they have achieved. Um, so I think what's happened is there were some very, very good centers 10 to 15 years ago those centers have continued to be very good centers with very high pregnancy rates, but many other centers have seemed to have caught up with them. And um, the interesting thing is that there doesn't seem to have been any huge jumps recently in the pregnancy rates that have been expected. So realistically, you're still talking uh, the same numbers now that you were talking five to seven or eight years ago in terms of pregnancy rates. Um, are there other things that are coming up to treat men with cystic fibrosis specifically? Nothing has really changed um, probably for almost 10 years now in the way that we retrieve sperm from the men with cystic fibrosis. It really hasn't changed. We've become a little bit better at it, um, but in principle it hasn't changed. And overall the pregnancy rates really haven't changed again for probably five to seven years um, overall. Um, do I see anything new coming up? Mm. The big new thing is coming up is our ability to predict fertility for the women more than we could before. So there's some new medications now that help us predict which women might have problems conceiving. So, for example, um, Anna mentioned that women who are over 35, the pregnancy mm -hmm. rates start dropping. But there are some women who are even younger um, who have older ovaries, and their ovarian function is not, you know, you can have a 33-year-old whose ovaries function like a 38-year-old. We're becoming better able to predict that now than we could a couple of years ago with new testing. Um, I think that's probably one of the big jumps, is we're now able to say, your chances are very poor, probably should not go ahead. Your chances are very, you know, reasonable even though the cost isn't reasonable, your, your chance of having a child would be pretty reasonable. And it may be worth your while to go ahead with that. So that's a long answer, Liz, but uh, that's that's what's going on. Yeah, and that's helpful. In fact, one of the questions that, that came in was, uh, was uh, looking at some of these issues about age of the of the partner and so um as Anna was mentioning you know success mm -hmm. in IVF in females is not being too old and so one of the questions was you know is the whole process going to be more successful the younger the woman is and i think you've really addressed that mm -hmm. that um age is age is key here so that um because there are other factors involved uh waiting until one is 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 older just reduces the chance of success. Would you agree with that, Liz, Keith? could I make one comment? Yeah. Um, I think it's wise at this, at any stage, if you have cystic fibrosis and you're seriously considering having children in the not-too-distant future, to have 
the women seen by a gynecologist who does some work in infertility because it's actually hard to predict um, ovarian failure early. There's some ways that we can predict it, but it's over, overall it's really hard to predict ovarian failure in women. And yes, overall, you should try to avoid having children in your late 30s because it becomes much harder. But there are a few people who are in their early 30s who will act like they're in their late 30s. Mm-hmm. So I think it's important if you're considering having children, say, in two years' time, it's probably worth looking at doing some basic investigations for the women right now to see if you're compromising your chances by waiting the two years. So one quick example is if a woman is 29 years old, waiting two years generally shouldn't be considered too much of an issue because the pregnancy rates at 31 or 32 overall are not much different than they are at 29. But there are some women who do go through early ovarian failure, and it might be advisable to try to pick them up earlier, particularly if you're thinking of having planning your children for two years in advance. So I think it's still worth it. I mean, it's a huge investment um, in in emotional time and Mm -hmm. financial investments. Um, If you're considering having children in in the sort of like the next couple of years, I think it's worth just going in and finding out now what the if it's wise to wait or not. Yep, that's that's very helpful. Because one other question that came in was sort of saying how far in advance should a man with CF be sort of start the planning process, assuming that say the genetic testing is already done and that their partner is not a carrier. Um, so you're suggesting it's sort of about two years in advance? I think if you're deciding to have children, it's reasonable at that point to get the basic information about it. So if you're quite sure that you're in your, maybe in your late 20s or early 30s, you're, you would like to wait two more years, I think it's very reasonable at that point to get the basic information to find out more about it, find out if there would be a problem on the woman's side because you don't really want to be surprised at 32 or 33 and find out that there's an issue. Then the other uh, the other aspect of that question is how long does it actually take to do all of this, right? If you decide today that you'd like to go through with an in vitro fertilization procedure, how long does that take to arrange? Um, it It's generally not great length of time, but you're probably talking more about four to six months before you could actually do the procedures. And that's just a matter of um, having all the testing done uh, and then arranging the time to have the procedures performed. So I would say you should leave yourself uh, like a six-month window to be to be on the safe side. Yep. That's very helpful. One of the other questions that came up was um, related to doing uh, CF carrier genetic testing, and um, one of the um, viewers was wondering if there was a cost to that. And I, I obviously I can't really uh, answer completely for the entire country, but certainly for the province of Ontario, carrier testing is no charge for um, a person because it's a clinically indicated test. And I would, um, I believe that it would be the same across the country, but certainly we could find out that information for the entire, um, all the provinces and uh, post that later on. Um, so. Uh, I, um... I, can I just butt in here? Sure. I just actually just did a CF presentation this morning for a group of nurses, and our nursing, um, our nurse educator was there for the CF clinic in Edmonton, and um, with that top that same question came up, and uh, there isn't a cost in Alberta. Okay, for that. that's very helpful. Yeah. yeah, I would think it would be covered because it is a medically, um, you know, appropriate test, and and yeah. you know, with universal health care, medically to- appropriate tests are are covered. In fact, in Ontario, CF testing, carrier testing, is available for um, for everyone. So anyone yeah. can ask for CF carrier testing in Ontario. I know when we had my husband tested sixteen year or eighteen years ago, um, he it, there was no cost back then. 
Yeah, if I okay. might, I may interject. Um, actually, in Ontario, most um, carrier testing that we have generated from our own program does not cause anything, and except for one couple, I remember um, the young woman was not a resident yet. She was from, from the States, and um, that probably, if I remember correctly, it cost close to $500 just because she was not a Canadian. She's not a resident of Canadian either, so that's the only case that I come across. All right. So, Liz, can I make one sure. uh, quick comment? Um, the carrier testing, at least in Ontario, was covered. Um, before you do the carrier testing, if it's a, this is a bit of a tricky area, um, and I have a long discussion with most of my patients before beginning any CF testing. Um, if the patient is, if you suspect they may have a condition associated with cystic fibrosis, and you have to make sure that um, that. So let me let me go back quickly here. Um, if patients um, come in and see me with infertility, and it's like Nathan came in with a condition, he didn't have a diagnosis of cystic fibrosis. He eventually had the testing was found to have cystic fibrosis. If you are found to have a diagnosis of cystic fibrosis, you have to be concerned also about your life insurability also. Mm -hmm. So I spend a lot of time with my patients before doing the CF testing, um, making sure that their life insurance is in order before they do the CF testing. Um, and while it's not um, um, – I don't think it makes any sense personally – for most of my patients, I don't think that the diagnosis of CF um, means that they will succumb to that particular condition. It's still a reality that the I, I have actually had patients who where the insurance has been refused because they have a, a new diagnosis of cystic fibrosis on their medical charts. Um, and so uh, before screening, um, I always uh, counsel with patients about that risk. Okay, thank you. I'm just going to do um, one last question. It's actually for Dr. Jarvie. Um, the question is, what is the likelihood that the other provinces will cover IVF for CF men, and is there active advocacy looking into this at this time? Wow, great question. <laughs> <laughs> love this it. is a good one, isn't it? Oh, it is. Um, it's uh, so Quebec has been very progressive about this, and that has been didn't have anything to do with cystic fibrosis, but it had much more to do with in vitro fertilization. And the CF population has benefited by the uh, the movement to cover IVF. Um, Canada actually is, in a lot of respects, the worst of both worlds. Um, a lot of American states have mandated. Uh, IVF coverage is part of their uh, insurance packages. So if some companies are offering insurance packages in a number of the American states, in vitro fertilization is mandated, is coverage mandated. Um, in Canada, I, I, it, it's really rare that a person will come in with insurance, in, at least in Ontario, uh, that covers their entire IVF program. Very rare. Um, so most of the people in Canada, apart from Quebec, are really doing it all on their own, and it is really quite uh, an onerous, um, uh, onerous for the for the patients. Um, I would love to see more advocacy because I think that's extremely unfair. And the interesting thing about this is, women in Ontario, I can't speak for the rest of Canada, women in Ontario with blocked tubes. Their IVF is covered, but men in Ontario with blocked tubes, their IVF is not covered. So this is great reverse sexism, and it, it's really annoying to me to um, to have this. So it was actually taken to a semi-judicial um, panel in Ontario many years ago with the exact question of why in Ontario, if women with blocked tubes have covered IVF, 
this does not extend to men with block tubes. And that was rejected in Ontario. And I have not seen any other um, move at sort of uh, with the Ministry of Health in Ontario to try to cover in vitro fertilization for men with block tubes. Having said that, in Ontario, there was a panel, uh, I believe it was last year, that was convened by the government of Ontario that did recommend to the government of Ontario that IVF be covered, a covered uh, benefit in Ontario. Uh, having said that, it has not gone any further than that panel recommendation. So that's the short and long of it. I, I don't see any major moves in Ontario, which I know best, to move to cover IVF. Um, and I think the only way to change it would be with concerted advocacy. And um, I would, you know, if anyone's willing to take that on, this is, uh, I think, a very big area to take on. Liz? On that note, Liz, <laughs> Well, you know, you know how I feel about it, and, and certainly um, Cystic Fibrosis Canada has has given this a try. I'm just not sure in this economic climate that um, there's a there's an interest uh, at the ministry level. Yeah, Liz, um, is that to that? Uh huh. Um, yeah, so I think it was a year and a half ago that um, well, Kelly Gorman and I we we'd sent letters to the minister about that. We actually had a meeting with one of her advisors, but then it never went any further than that. So it's definitely something, you know, the ACFC wants to continue with, probably once the government is all sorted out in this province anyway. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's an interesting way to end the webinar on a political note. Um, I'd like to um, thank everybody for uh, joining us this evening. Uh, this recording will be posted up on Cystic Fibrosis Canada's website next week. Um, and if there's any other questions, um, please send them to info at cysticfibrosis.ca. So info at cysticfibrosis.ca. And we'll make sure that uh, you get an answer to your question. So you might go, you know, go off and think about things and, and think of a question. Please, please let us know and we'd be happy to try and answer it. So thank you all again for participating, and um, we'll see you at some point in the future. Thanks.